Uh, my name is Fan from the University of Michigan. Today, I'm going to present SOAR. SOAR is a federated execution engine with faster job execution and high resource utilization. It's a joint work with Jie, Xiangfeng, Hasha, and Mushaf. As we know, data processing is very popular these days to serve efficient data analytics. There are lots of work trying to distribute the computation across multiple machines. Some popular examples include Spark and Task, which are widely used inside a single cluster. More recently, we are seeing an increasing trend of data analytics over the wide area networks where the source data is often geo-distributed. For example, big companies may need to run interactive queries on their global database. And in all these avenues, lots of work has been done to improve the performance in fact, all these efforts have formed a stack of big data processing, and here's the anatomy. The top is the application layer, where users submit various jobs, like SQL queries or streaming processing jobs. For each job, the execution planner will generate the execution plan. As shown here, the execution plan is often a directed graph with task dependencies. In fact, this execution plan is the input to execution engines, which consists of a central coordinator and multiple workers. Given task assignments, the coordinator orchestrates these workers in the control plane, and the workers run the task in the data plane. During this course, the execution engine interacts with the resource scheduler and the storage system. Now let's bring back these efforts and see what happens if we categorize them. As shown here, we can notice these efforts have customized many layers for different scenarios, like different execution planners in the line setting or in the one setting. However, the execution engines available today are still the ones primarily designed for data center networks, that's Spark and Task. But in real, even for these execution engines, their network conditions can be diverse depending on their host machines and the line or van settings. So this arises a question, how's the performance of these execution engines? In today's talk, we will first answer this, and afterwards, we will elaborate why we need to and how to redesign execution engines. But first, let's start with the performance of existing engines in diverse network conditions. Here, we will start with a latency-sensitive data set with Apache Spark, and this figure shows the distribution of job performance. The x-axis reports the job completion time, and let's start from the first two lines. We can notice, although we change the network bandwidth from 10 gigabit per second to only one gigabit per second, their performance remains almost the same. However, when we turn to a high latency setting, say hundreds of millisecond network latency, as shown in the right two lines, we can notice a great performance loss. Here, the high latency networks can lead to slow job executions. In fact, this performance loss largely comes from the control plane inefficiency, and this figure shows the coordinations in existing designs. Given a queue of tasks, the coordinator will launch new tasks on the worker, and this task scheduling is late bending. So the worker will request the new task only after the completion of the last task. This can benefit a precise view for real-time decisions. However, when the network latency becomes hundreds of milliseconds, this late bedding of tasks can lead to great underutilization of resource because workers can be blocking on requesting new task assignments. And next, let's see what happens if we turn to our bandwidth-intensive job. Here, this figure shows the execution flow of our bandwidth-intensive job, where each stage has multiple tasks. Across the dependent stages, there are data shuffles over the network. In this talk, we will present the results in our low bandwidth and low latency setting. And the right figure shows the timeline of resource usage. The x-axis is the timeline, and the y-axis reports the percentage of resource utilization like the occupation of CPU cores in the orange line. 
As we can see, across all these stages, tasks were occupied their CPUs when they get started. However, if we check the actual CPU and network utilization, as shown in this figure, we can notice for stage two and stage three, when the task is busy with data preparations over the network, the network is fully utilized. However, the actual CPU utilization is pretty low. So when it comes to the low bandwidth, CPU is underutilized during task executions. This is because even in case of low bandwidth networks, these tasks will still hog their CPUs for data preparation and computation throughout the lifespan. So this resource provisioning in the data plane is tightly coupled, which can lead to CPU underutilizations. To recap, both the high latency and low bandwidth can lead to CPU underutilization. However, this inefficiency is bound to the task itself, which only can be solved in the execution layer. To tackle this inefficiency, in this talk, we introduce SOAR. SOAR is a federated execution engine for diverse network conditions. It can provide faster job execution and higher resource utilization. And next, we will start our system architecture. Here, we introduce the system architecture in a wide area setting, but it can also embrace the setting inside a single cluster. As shown here, the top is the central coordinator. It handles task arrivals and orchestrates job executions across multiple sites. In each site, there is a site manager which manages a queue of tasks. In case of high latency networks, the coordinator will push tasks to the remote site, and the site manager will manage these queued tasks. The bottom is the worker where the task manager is in charge of the physical resource. With this federated system architecture, we next talk about how to design efficient control plane to tackle the high latency networks. Here, we advocate the early banning of tasks because we want to push tasks to the remote side so that we can hide the expensive scheduling latency. Because in existing designs, the coordinator interacts with the remote worker directly, leading to the idleness of workers. But in so, instead of pulling tasks for the individual worker, we introduce a set manager to bring tasks close to workers. This way, the coordinator can push multiple tasks to the remote site manager, and when a task completes, the site manager can launch a new task from its local queue. Meanwhile, the coordinator can push a new task to the site manager. This way, coordination between the coordinator and site managers are pipelined with task executions on the worker to guarantee a high utilization. But on the other hand, Task scheduling within our site is still late banning because we want to retain a precise view of resource status. It looks straightforward so far, but this early banning of tasks will still introduce new challenges. To make it real, the first challenge we need to address is to decide how many tasks to push, which outlines a trade-off between the utilization and scheduling quality. Say if we queued up too few tasks, then under utilization of workers again. However, if we queued up too many, then lots of tasks are bound to the particular site too early, leading to the suboptimal task placements. In fact, as long as the worker is not blocking or requesting new task assignments, pushing mode does not help anymore. So the total execution time of these queued tasks should be slightly greater than this round trip time. This way, workers are busy with task executions all the time. So with a precise view of task durations, we can dynamically push by following this target. Although it's unlikely to get the exact task duration, so can still handle the stochastic task durations with hofting bound. More details can refer to our paper. Another challenge here is to decide how to push with task dependencies, because the optimal placement of the downstream task often relies on a full knowledge of their upstream outputs. It is especially true for the bandwidth-intensive tasks, because we want to reduce data shuffles over the network. 
to give you more details, the spoiler a two stage of running on existing engines. The left figure shows the task dependencies among these three tasks. And the right figure shows the timeline of execution, where we introduce set one, the coordinator, and set two. Here, task one is running in set one, and task two in set two. When task one completes, it generates a larger output partition than task two. So in this case, the optimal placement of task three is set one, because we can avoid large data transfers from set one to set two. By collecting a full knowledge of this output information, existing designs can make the optimal decision. However, to hide the expensive scheduling latency in SOAR, we may have already pushed the task three in advance. Without a full knowledge of this output information, this can lead to a new trade-off between the utilization and scheduling quality again. To strike this trade-off, SOAR will first try to improve the resource utilization by pushing by speculation. One way is to reuse the historical information, like iterative stages in streaming applications or periodic job executions. As shown in the right figure, with the correct speculation, task three can be pushed to site one in advance, and the completion of task two will activate the execution of task three. Compared to existing designs on the left, we can notice SOAR saves round trip coordinations. Moreover, even for the bandwidth intensive task, SOAR can still retain good scheduling quality because SOAR can recover from mistakes efficiently by the worker initiated rescheduling. To see how it works, let's replay the prior example, but in a worst case, where task three is pushed to set two by mistake. And now let's see how SOAR recovers for a better placement of task three. Here, when task one completes, its task manager detects a large output partition. It will then notify set two to cancel the pending task three and ask the coordinator for rescheduling. The rest will perform similar to existing designs and we can notice this task cancellation, as shown in the red line, is pipelined with the task rescheduling. So SOAR does not make things any worse than the baseline. To recap, in designing the control plane, SOAR can decide the right number of tasks to push. And even in case of task dependencies, SOAR can still improve the resource utilization by speculation while retaining good scheduling quality by recovering. And next, we we'll turn to the data plane decoupling to tackle the low bandwidth network. Here, we decouple the resource provisioning in task executions to improve the overall resource utilization. Because in existing designs, tasks were hog their CPUs throughout the lifespan, which can lead to CPU underutilizations. So in SOAR, we split the role of task executions by introducing two types of subtasks. Here, the communication task will prepare the data over networks. During this course, so it will match the actual CPU utilization and may use less CPUs for data preparation. When task, the communication task completes, the so it will create the computation task to perform the real data processing. This way, so it can scale down the CPU requirements during data preparations, and the reclaimed resource can be repurposed for other job executions. To make it real, we first outline the control flow of decoupling. As shown in this figure, new tasks with large remote reads were activated so to create the communication task. And afterwards, so will check the status of data preparation. Here, the first challenge we need to address is to decide how many communication tasks to create, because creating too many or too few will still lead to resource underutilization. In fact, they should adapt to the available network bandwidth, so we can decide the number of communication tasks with the profile of network and its corresponding CPU usage. But on the other hand, tasks without large remote read will be appended to the task queue and may continuously take up the available CPU use. For the bandwidth intensive tasks, although they have released their unused CPU use during data preparation, but unfortunately, their computation tasks may even get stopped due to a lack of CPU use. To minimize this overhead, so we'll prioritize the computation task. 
As we can see in this figure, when the data preparation completes, so will prioritize the computation tasks over others in resource allocation. This way, we can minimize the overhead in both communication and computation. By taking all this together, we have built our prototype for generic data processing. And in our evaluation, we start with a wide area setting across 10 data centers. This figure shows our deployment over van. And in our evaluation, we want to investigate how so performs compared to existing designs and across the design space. More evaluations can refer to our paper. Let's start with the job performance and resource utilization. Here we use a mixed workload of TPC queries and TerraSort, and we use Apache Spark as the baseline. The right figure shows the distribution of job performance. The x-axis reports the job completion time, and the orange one is SOAR, the black one is Spark. Our goal is to make the line closer to the y-axis. As we can notice, SOAR outperforms Spark. And if we break down the performance, say the dot line is SOAR without data plane decoupling, we can notice with control plane optimizations, this improvement is around 2.6 times on average. If we incorporate the data plane decoupling, this benefits more. In total, SOAR can improve the job performance by around 16 times on average, while achieving 1.8 times better CPU utilization. In addition to the wide area setting, SOAR can still work well with different network bandwidth settings in the line. Here, the left figure shows SOAR performance in a low bandwidth setting. And we can notice SOAR outperforms Spark by around four times on average. And even when we move to a high bandwidth setting, as shown in the right figure, SOAR can still match Spark. So SOAR performs well across the design space. To recap, SOAR is a federated execution engine for diverse network conditions. It can provide faster job execution and higher resource utilization. In designing SOAR, we want to improve the CPU utilization. And to this end, we introduce early banding of tasks in the control plane and the decoupling of resource provisioning in the data plane. All source code is available on the website, and we plan to release more. That's all from me about SOAR, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions for Fan? Let me start with one question. Uh -huh. Does the scheduler regret its decision if it makes a suboptimal decision? Uh, actually, we want, I want to highlight two things. First, uh, how to do the speculation is a business of the scheduler. And here we focus on the execution layer. As shown previously, this inefficiency is bound to the task itself. Mm -hmm. So here we just optimize the execution layer. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, even in case of misprediction, as we showed earlier, SOAR can still perform no worse than the baseline. So this is our performance guarantee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you. Yes.